Hello! This episode of the Taylor series is with regards to the novel coronavirus of early 2020, and more specifically, this idea of flattening the curve and the mathematics behind this curve, and what we can do to do our part to squish it. The date is March 16th, and I live near one of the epicenters of this thing, which is why all schools in my area have been closed indefinitely, but I am not panicking, and neither should you because it's the same sort of thing that I tell my students when I teach them how to use power tools. That is to say, don't be terrified of the power tool because that could cost you a finger. But also don't be apathetic to how the power tool works because that could cost you a finger. The thinking goes the same here. If you understand how these math tools work, you'll realize that you don't need to panic, but at the same time, there are steps that you should take in order to help do our part so that we can stay as safe as we possibly can. So with that said, let's head on over to the computer where we can do some math. So here we are. This is a graph of time versus cases. On the x-axis, as we go this way, you'll see more time passes. And on the y-axis, as you go up, more cases occur. Now, what I mean by cases will change a little bit. Sometimes I'll mean cases that have started, sometimes I'll mean cases that have finished, sometimes I'll mean the number of cases open at a given moment, but I'll tell you what the context is anytime I put another curve on the screen. You'll also notice that I don't have any numbers here. That is intentional for two reasons. One, you could be anywhere in the world watching this, and the numbers that I supply here may not apply to you. Two, the data is going to be changing from day to day, and as we get better data, more tests out there, the numbers are going to get more and more refined, and I don't want to put out numbers today that will just be superseded tomorrow. So full disclosure, the way I set this up was with numbers that essentially give the character of what I'm trying to explain to you without actually going into the nitty gritty. With that, let's begin. First off, all the equations and things I use to make the graphs you're about to see is kept over here. Don't worry about the details of it. You don't need to understand this. Pay attention to the actual graph itself, and I'll explain what's happening as I do it. Now, the fact that this disease is spreading means that we need to come up with some kind of mathematical model that explains it. And the place that our understanding begins is called an exponential. The reason is because exponentials have a property that very closely resemble what happens in the real world. Say you have some number of people sick. They're going to get more people sick. The number of sick people is then increased, and so the next time cycle, even more people will get sick, and so on and so forth. The fact that the rate at which people get sick depends on the number of people who are currently sick means that this is going to grow exponentially, and it looks something like this. Now this is a timeline. As you go forward, you see we get more and more cases. Now the thing is that right here in the early stages, things look like they're going pretty well because there are not that many cases. However, this is an exponential curve, meaning that that rate of change is just going to increase and increase as time goes on. More cases means more new cases. What happens is what you would expect. It goes up very quickly after a certain point, and you get this very classic curve. But this is the real world we're talking about, so this is not truly an exponential. This is actually a logistic curve. It only looks exponential at the very beginning. But if we zoom out, then what we notice is this it begins to slow down as it gets to a certain point. That point can be a couple of things. It could be the total number of people in the world, but more likely, it's the number of people who are actually susceptible to this particular disease, which is not necessarily everybody. But that being said, once the number of diagnosed cases has reached basically everyone it's going to, the curve flattens out and basically just stays there. This right here is called a logistic curve, and it very closely models what we observe in the world as we learn more about a pandemic. So that sets the stage. What we want to do now is to model another feature of the progression of this disease, and that is what happens when the cases close. It looks very similar to the original curve, it's simply offset in time. These cases close either due to death of the patient, or more likely, the recovery of the patient. Either way, after a certain amount of time on average, the case closes and they are no longer necessarily sick. It's not yet known whether or not this novel coronavirus will reinfect people, so for right now I'm simply not going to model it. So the fact that we're now accounting for the fact that cases close gets us closer to the thing we're really concerned about. And so the next step is to look at how many open cases we have at any given time. That is to say, we take the number of cases, we then subtract off the number of closed cases, and that tells us how many are currently open. Near the beginning, almost all cases are open that exist because no one's gotten over it yet. Near the middle, there's a large chunk of people who have had their cases closed, and near the end, there's not a lot of people who still have the disease because nearly all the cases have closed. So what we're going to do is to take this quantity and graph it coming off the x-axis. It looks like this. 
as we sort of scroll through time, you can see how that goes up and up and up, reaches its peak around here, and then goes back down and down and down. If you put all those points together, it looks like the curve that we've seen so often. This curve is how many open cases there are at any given moment. As you can tell, it starts off low, gets high in the middle, and then comes right back down. So that's pretty much how that curve comes into existence. But the thing is that not all people who get sick are necessarily going to need to go to the hospital. There's only going to be a certain percentage of that. And I'm not going to cite a percentage right now because, as I said earlier, any numbers I would give you right now are sort of at the very beginning of this epidemic in the United States of America. It may be different in your country, the numbers are going to get more accurate as time goes on and we get more tests out there. But the notion is still the same, some percent on average are going to need hospitalization. So let's take a look at that curve and head back to the computer. So this curve represents the number of people who are going to need hospitalization. While this is smaller than the other curve, when you zoom in, it looks pretty much the same. It's still a bell curve. So what that means is at any given time, you can see how many people need care at that given moment. This line right here represents the capacity of all of the hospitals and other medical facilities in your area. Not necessarily anyone's in particular. Again, this is just a character graph without numbers. What you can see from this though, is that you'd think that all the people below the line are getting proper medical care, but they're not because we're overloading that medical system and that's going to create a problem. This means that there is going to be a chunk of people who do not get proper medical care. And with this particular virus, that does mean that it will increase the fatality rate. What that also means is that if you have some other problem that requires medical attention, you'll be getting help from a system that's currently overburdened, and that is suboptimal. So now we've teed up the problem, now let's go ahead and talk about what we can do. Coming back to what I said earlier, this is the curve that we are going to try to flatten. To do that, I'm going to change the growth rate, a number that in an exponential or logarithmic curve essentially dictates how quickly it grows. Watch what happens when I cut that number into just a third, roughly, of what it is now. As you can see, a few things have changed. First, the curve is a lot lower and hopefully will not oversaturate the medical system. Second, it also lasts for a lot more time. As you can see, it goes all the way out here, whereas previously, it ended much earlier. But this is okay. What that means is that all of the people in this area here who would not have received optimal care can now receive optimal care because it took much longer and the system never got overburdened. That is what we mean by flattening the curve. Now, how does that relate to what we can do specifically? Well, to understand that, we're going to try to understand something called the basic reproduction number. The basic reproduction number is essentially going to tell you how many new cases you will get from an illness for having one case. So if the basic reproduction number is two, then one person who is sick over the course of their entire illness will get two other people sick. The way you calculate it is a matter of scholarly debate, but the one that I like best is one that multiplies three things together. The transmissibility, which tells you how likely an infected individual may sicken a vulnerable individual, the duration of infectiousness, which is what it sounds like, and the average rate of contact, which is the number of contacts you have over time. Now here's the thing that I find interesting about this. These three things are multiplied together to give you R0, which is the basic reproduction number. That means that if you cut any one of them in half, you cut R0 in half. That's great. Two of these things we can't do a whole lot about. We can do something about the transmissibility, which is why you see people saying, wash your hands, don't touch your face, so on. But the duration of infectiousness isn't something we can do a whole lot about. However, the average rate of contact between susceptible and infected people is something we can do something about. This is where the notion of social distancing is coming from. If you lower the number of contacts you have, you lower the opportunities for this disease to spread. And here's how that plays out in the numbers. Now, R0 and the growth rate are two different numbers. The growth rate, again, is a number involved in a formula that makes a curve, whereas R0 is calculated differently. But they are related. R. Okay. Yeah. This is probably not the video for jokes. Anyway, what that means is that if you lower one, you will lower the other. And that's what we're trying to do with social distancing. But governments are moving very quickly right now. In the time it took me to record and shoot and edit this video, we've already had some new measures imposed wherein restaurants are going to close in just a couple of hours for who knows how long. If you're among those who cannot stay home, then simply do your best to keep yourself safe and all the non-essential interactions try to avoid for a while. 
If you're watching this in the distant future, and hopefully you are and everything turned out fine, then great, you got a really good primer on how all of this stuff works. So I've left some links in the description below that lead to some very interesting things to either read or watch related to the coronavirus. However, that's not all. If you find yourself with some extra time and you're trying to find something to do that's kind of together but separately, consider making something for the anti-social art show. Whether it's a craft project or an art thing or you jamming out on your ukulele, take a picture of it and share it on Instagram with the hashtag anti-social art show. It's kind of a tongue twister, actually. Only rule is, is that you've got to use your own art supplies that are already in your possession. Check out the gallery of submissions at www.antisocialartgallery.org. Thank you to Aragami for hosting this episode of the Taylor series. The next episode will probably come to you from me shooting at home, so we'll see. Thank you to all of my patrons who helped make this possible. I couldn't do this without you. And congratulations to you on reaching the next term in your own Taylor expansion. Please be safe, be kind to each other, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.